Hello, hello, family. Siemi, siemi. Shalom, shalom. Salama, salama to all my brothers and sisters out there, wherever you are in the world. Um, this is a very interesting topic I'm going to be speaking about today uh, and vital as well um, to our knowledge of the truth as a people and, and, and the way the world is working, number one. You know, as we look at our history, we see certain things that are that have happened to us as a people. And, you know, it must bring you to question, you know, did slash do they really fear him? Did or do they really fear him? And for those of you who've seen my last uh, video, you know, it was inspired by uh, Proverbs Eight, verse 13, which says the fear of the father is to hate evil. The fear of the father is to hate evil. So for all those people who say they fear our heavenly father, they fear God or the creator, right? It says, well, to fear him is to hate evil. Hence, why this uh, topic today, we're going to be discussing is titled, did slash do they really fear him so with that being said we're gonna i'm gonna play a video um, for you to check out just to give you some uh to give you some insight on the mentality of of those that are oppressing us sub-saharan africa has been fundamental to the global prosperity of the advanced countries okay and Africa had a role to play. It has a role as a raw material producer. We will not allow Sub-Saharan Africa to escape that. Okay, we do everything to keep Sub-Saharan Africa where it is, also impoverished. It's absolutely vital for the prosperity of everyone else. So let's get clear about that. Okay, and this means all the economic structures all the global institutions and the economics we teach everyone is all designed to keep Africa exactly where it is. And whether it is Europe or US or now China, it's always the same. We need Africa to be impoverished because we need those raw materials and we need them dirt cheap. Okay, so that's the message. It doesn't mean to say that there's nothing Africans can do. Of course there is, okay? But this is the opposition that they're fighting. This is what it's about. Because if Africa does do something different, I assure you living standards of all those in Europe and North America and Asia is going to fall, okay? And that is a big price to pay. I assure you that the West is not going to allow that without a big fight. Okay, so this is what it's fundamentally about. Uh, what I want to show you is how these structures are operating. It's just 20 minutes, so we can't do very much, but just to give you a little bit of an idea, and why I keep the ideology part there is because we are part of the producers of ideology. At universities and academic institutions, we are complicit in this whole enterprise, okay? So the job of many Western academics is to convince Africans they have to keep doing what they're doing, okay? And to show them it's your fault that you're poor. It's not our fault. It's your fault that you're poor, you know? So this is what we do in academic institutions, and I, I want to show that as well. We just start. This is what it's basically about, so you, you know what it's about. But I want to just show you the extent to which Africa is specializing in the production of raw materials and basic agricultural goods. Um, we know the basic forces that have caused this underdevelopment. We know it's colonization. I will not discuss that very much because my colleague speaker is going to go into some aspects of this, but I do want to discuss the global economic structures, the global financial institutions, and economic ideology, briefly, to give you a flavor of those. 
Let me start with this. You can't really see it so easily, but if those of you who are interested, you want the PowerPoint, I'm sure we can make it available to you. Uh, but the thing that you really need to see is the top line. Okay. And the extent of dependency is captured by this statistic at the top. Okay. And you compare it with all other income groups. And what you see is essentially in that one statistic how dependent Sub-Saharan Africa is on raw material production. Okay. This is the very heart of what makes Sub-Saharan Africa beat. Okay. Here, just to have a look at one very important additional statistic with all this export coming from Sub-Saharan Africa, how much does Sub-Saharan Africa account for in terms of global trade value? value? We know there are vast resources coming from there, but look at the bottom line in terms of global trade value. Look at that. 0.5% 1975, 0.95% going down to 0.1, 2.1, meaning that with all these vast resources being produced, how much are they getting for it? Nothing, nothing. This is a very significant piece of data. Then I just want to show you what has happened to sub-Saharan Africa, because what we know, what we know, and from all studies, no country ever develops without manufacturing. Okay, producing raw materials will not take you anywhere. <laughs> producing basic agricultural goods will not take you anywhere. And let's have a look at how much manufacturing activity takes place in sub-Saharan Africa. We can look over the last 15 odd years. 15, 20 years. And we see manufacturing has actually declined as a percentage of the total. This is percentages of total production in sub-Saharan Africa. How much of it is accounted for by manufacturing? So this figure here is 17% of the total. Most of the rest, when we talk of industry, it includes manufacturing, but the bulk of it is mining, okay? Raw material extraction. This is the bulk of it. And here we, we see actually raw material extraction has stayed the same. What has caused industry to fall is the fall in manufacturing production. This is deliberate because we will never as Western economists, as Western policymakers, we cannot afford to allow Africa to industrialize and start producing manufacturers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we will do everything to stop that. And okay. So as you guys just heard, literally this man just said that the whole system, even including the economic um uh, the economic, what's the word? I would say layout, right? For the economic educational system is to, is formed to keep Africa poor, including all the educational systems uh, around the world, all the academic systems. As he said, it is formed to keep Africans in poverty, to keep Africa poor. This is their mentality. It, so, when I ask, you know, do they really fear him? Do they really hate evil? I mean, just from that video alone, one might get the come to the conclusion that no, these people do not hate evil. In fact, it's the exact opposite. So we must have a, a mentality to really begin to analyze and get a, and come to terms with the truth. And that is this system that the world is built on is not built to uplift those that are 
I would say, of lesser fortune, less fortunate. This system that is created by the Western elite globalists, whatever you want to call them, is, is created to keep people impoverished and to keep people in slavery. And I don't think that's just in Africa. I think it's worldwide. I believe it's worldwide. And so one of the, obviously we see one of their biggest weapons now is academia, the academic, um, uh, their, their academic uh, organizations. But we also must realize that Christianity was a tool used to colonize a lot of uh, Africa and also Islam. But Christianity is more where my focus is because that's something that, as me, as someone who reads the, the Bible, you know, that's something that I have to do my due diligence and research thoroughly. So with Christian, Christianity being used as a method to colonize and enslave people, we must begin to question these people who bring us, not only do we see that they didn't fear the most high, right? But we must begin to question if we, we can trust what they have given us. But I'm gonna show another video. We're gonna to continue to examine this and we're gonna to continue to go deeper in this discussion and, and this vital, vital topic. Our Congolese have been massacred by white people in the Congo for years and years and years. And if uh, the shoe is now on the other foot, uh, only thing I can say is it's like chickens that always come back home. The Belgium in 1865 at the age of 30. Uh, enormously shrewd, enormously greedy, enormously ambitious. Uh, and with an absolutely brilliant sense of public relations. He hired the explorer, Henry Morton Stanley, the man who found Livingston, to go to the Congo and essentially stake out this huge territory for him. Leopold got first the United States and then all the major nations of Western Europe to ratify his seizure of this enormous territory in the center of the continent. First, Leopold created a smokescreen, claiming that he wished to educate a savage people. They were all really fooled by Leopold because they uh, took him at his word. They thought he was a sort of a man who's going to lose all his money in this crazy philanthropic venture. But they didn't realize what he was really after at all, which was to make himself hugely rich by exploiting brown hands and broad backs who were going to carry the wealth of Africa and loaded on ships for his own personal profit. Extreme violence was employed to impose Leopold's dominion. The right hands of those who failed to meet rubber quotas were severed. Even young children were not spared. In 1896, a German newspaper reported that 1,308 hands had been gathered in one day. Leopold created a 90,000 strong army to enforce his rule. One of his lieutenants wrote, only the whip can civilize the black. They would go into village after village the army would seize the women of the village and hold them hostage in order to force the men of each village to go into the forest and gather a monthly quota of wild rubber. And they did this for about 20 years. And you can just very easily imagine if you have a village where the women are all being held hostage, the men are all in the forest as forced laborers for several weeks out of each month. There's nobody to plant and harvest food, to go hunting, to go fishing, to do all the normal things through which a community feeds itself. So from all of these causes, starvation, being worked to death, and most of all from the disease that hit this famine. It's something different. But how many people here have cell phones? If you got your cell phone, raise your cell phone. Get your cell phone. 
pull it out, pull out, raise it. Cell phones that we had, in order for those cell phones to be produced, most of the cell phones that we have, you need a mineral called coltan. A mineral called coltan. Much of this mineral comes from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The Congo is one, one of the richest countries on the planet is the Congo. The Belgium and the U.S. government. And they assassinated him. Then a gentleman by the name of Mobutu became, became to power. And the U.S. gave him over $300 million to oppress his own people, to make sure gold and silver and coltan would continue to flow to Europe and the United States and Australia. And then in 1997, when Mobutu died of cancer, uh, there was another person who came to power by the name of Kabila. And Kabila then eventually died, but a civil war ensued. In order to finance the civil war, because cell phones were exploding at that time, they would mine coal tank. Seemed like much, but in order to, this cell phone you have, the cell phone I have, it has coal tan in it. In order to get that coal tan, they would kidnap children to mine the coal tan in the Congo. In the last 10 years or so, 5.4 million children have been murdered in the Congo. 5 million people. Let me, let me explain it this way. In World War II, 400,000 people died. In the Civil War, 500,000 people. 5.4 million people. Larger than any other conflict, any other war since World War II. More people have died in the Congo than any other conflict in the last 40 years of combined. Because it's happening in Africa, in the Congo, and there's so much money at stake. Coal tans. All right, so as you guys just heard, this man is just breaking down pretty much what, you know, showing us uh, examples of what the gentleman in the first video I showed was saying and how because of money, they are impoverishing and enslaving Africans even to this day. This is going on even to this day. So you must question these people who came and gave us the Bible. These people who came in the name of Christianity, in the name of Jesus, right? Did they really fear the Heavenly Father? we can obviously see that the answer is no, because they did not hate evil and they were actually doing the opposite. Now, one of the things I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring out here, uh, if you give me a second to, uh, to bring it out, uh, I'm gonna bring out this letter as we've, taught, we've seen that King Leopold was in the Congo and that's the area that he had ceased right and took over so what we're going to look at now is the letter from king leopold that he actually wrote to his missionaries and we're going to break that down in connection with everything that we've seen so far all right so i'm gonna enlarge that for you so you can read along all right, this letter comes from the university, uh, the Federal University of Minas Gerais. Um, so here it goes. We're just going to go ahead and begin because now we're going to see um, how exactly they colonized Africa, Congo, and other regions, you know, um, probably not just there, but also throughout the world. So dissecting his letter, it says, letter from King Leopold II of Belgium to colonial missionaries, 1883. A reverence 
fathers and dear compatriots. The task that is given to you to is given to fulfill is very delicate and requires much tact. You will go certainly to evangelize, but your evangelization must inspire above all Belgian interests. All right, so first we can see that they're coming in what the name of Christianity. All right, it says, your principal objective in our mission in the Congo is never to teach the niggers to know God. This they already know. They speak and submit to a mungu, mungu meaning God, one nzambi, one nzakomba, and what else? I don't know. Now, nzambi, nzambi is the name of their God, and nzakomba simply means God of our fathers. It says, they know that to kill, to sleep with someone else's wife, to lie and to insult is bad. Have courage to admit it. You are not going to teach them what they already know. Your essential role is to facilitate, your, your essential role is to facilitate the task of administrators and industrials, which means you will go to interpret the gospel in the way it will best uh, it will be best to protect your interest in that part of the world. All right, so now they're told that they're going to be manipulating the gospel for their interest, to protect their interest. It says, for these things, you have to keep watch on disinteresting our savages from the richness that is plenty in their underground to avoid that they get interested in it and make you murderous competition and dream one day to overthrow you. So basically, don't, don't show them you're about to get rich because they're going to take interest, right? And they will overthrow you in the region for what is already theirs. Well, let's continue. It says, your knowledge of the gospel will allow you to find text ordering and encouraging your followers to love poverty like happier are the poor because they will inherit the heaven and it's very difficult for the rich to enter the kingdom of god you have to detach them uh, you have to detach from them and make them disrespect everything which gives courage to affront us i make reference to their mystic their mystic system and their war fetish warfare protection which they pretend not to want to abandon and you must do everything in your power to make it disappear. All right, so we see they're coming in, manipulating the gospel to get people to love poverty. Poverty, And not only that, but they're also getting them to disrespect the things that they've grown up knowing. And one of the, uh, so interesting that, you know, they're, they're, focusing on trying to get these people to love poverty. One of the verses, uh, I'm going to, I just want to read real quick to show the, you know, the true manipulation of the gospel, right? It's is from Matthew 27, Matthew chapter 27. Uh, and it comes from verse It comes from verse 57. It says, when the even was come, right? This was after the Messiah was supposedly killed on the cross, right? And he died. And it says that when the even was come, there was a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus or Yesiah's disciple. He went to Pilate and begged for the body. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. So this man's begging for the body of the Messiah, right? And it says, and when the even was come, uh, a rich man. So this man was rich. But notice what it said. It said, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus or Messiah's disciple. So a rich man was Yesiah's disciple, but they're telling you happier are the poor because they will inherit the heaven. But so that we have this rich man, right? <laughs> uh, 
who was a disciple. That's very interesting. Now, this just shows you how they really were manipulating the gospel, you know, uh, and using the gospel, using Christianity to impoverish these people. All right, now I'm gonna continue reading. It says, your action will be directed essentially to the younger ones for they won't revolt when the recommendation of the priest is contra contradictory to their parents' teachings. The children have to learn to obey what the missionary recommends who is the father of their souls. You must singularly insist on their total submission and obedience, avoiding, <clears throat> I'm sorry, and obedience, avoid developing the spirit in the schools, teach students to read and not to reason. So this is their whole focus, right? And now, and now we can see uh, a, a tool or a tactic that they're using is to, is to basically bring separation between the younger generation and the, the, the elder generation, right? The younger generation and the elder generation so that they don't respect what their parents are teaching them. And, and, and to them, it will be threatening if they obey their parents because they're gonna miss out on the kingdom of heaven, right? And actually, this is literally them teaching them to break what is known as the, the fifth commandment, which is to honor thy mother and thy father. So literally, this is how our people are walking in and stepping into becoming cursed by breaking the covenant, which we have with our creator. So we can see here uh, what they're doing, right? So I'm going to continue reading. It says, they're dear, they're dear patriots. Oh, and just before I continue, we see also that they're talking about not developing the spirit in the schools, right? Teach them to read, not to reason. So we must keep focus. And, and that, unfortunately, is what something I see even in Christianity is that people are, you know, and, and, and those that are awakening up to the truth is that we still are not reasoning and we're just reading but we must begin to ask ourselves certain questions. But let me continue. It says, there, dear patriots, are some of the principles that you must apply. You will find many other books which will be given to you at the end of this conference. Evangelize the niggers so that they stay forever in submission to the white colonialists. Listen how they stay forever, forever to the white colonialists. This is their plan. This is not a short-term plan. This is a long-term plan. So they never revolt against the restraints they are undergoing. Recite every day. Happier, happy are those who are weeping because the kingdom of God is for them. Convert always the blacks by using the whip. Keep their women in nine months of submission to work freely for us. Force them to pay you in sign of recognition, goats, chicken, or egg, eggs every time you visit their village and make sure that niggers never become rich. Seeing every day, it is impossible for the rich to enter heaven. Make them pay, it is impossible for the rich to enter heaven. But we just seen even in the gospel that there was a rich disciple, right? <laughs> of the Messiah, right? So we see how they're manipulating and using Christianity to keep us poor, right? It says, make them pay tax each week at Sunday mass. Pay taxes, not tithing, they're paying taxes. And that's what a lot of people are doing today. Use the money supposed for the poor to build flourishing business centers, institution and confessional system, which allows you to be good detectives denouncing any black that has a different consciousness contrary to that of the decision maker. Teach the niggers to forget their heroes and to adore only ours. Wow. Never, represent, never present a chair to, to a black that comes to visit you. Don't give him more than one cigarette Never invite him for dinner, even if he gives you a chicken every time you arrive at his house. 
says the above speech which shows the real intention of the christian mission missionary journey in africa was exposed to the world by dr mukwani mukwani bukoko born in the congo in 1915 and who in 1935 while working in the congo bought a secondhand bible from a belgian priest who forgot the speech in the bible so the cat was out of the bag now <laughs> but this this letter shows you the true intentions of the colonial missionaries was to bring disorder in our communities which we see going on even to this day children disrespecting the elder generation the elder generation had not having respect for the younger generation there's no unity not having good guidance and guide you know those to 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 give us wisdom and instruction right and we're still being enslaved even to this day so this really must make you question you know this really must make you question when we talk about do they fear the heavenly father absolutely not they do not fear him because they do not hate evil in fact they are doing the exact opposite of evil and have been doing the exact opposite of evil for a very 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 long time to us as a people we've experienced some of the most horrific evils that this world has ever seen so we cannot say that they have given us truth and that they have feared the father in their hate for evil even to this day they have never feared the father because they have never hated evil and now i know that there are some you know i know it seems as if um just specifically speaking on white people and it's not because i know not all white people are evil <laughs> i know not all white people have a, a a murderous heart in them i know that for a fact but what we've experienced in this world in this life there's a system that is set up there is a system that is set up that is based on evil and wickedness so we must really be questioning questioning that and don't be fooled you know by color the spirit of evil and corruption does not have a color boundary why do i say that here is a picture of black arab slave traders who had their hands involved in the enslavement of the bantu people those that were the chosen people of the most high those that were in the sub-saharan african region who had an expansive kingdom that was the kingdom of Israel or the kingdom of Isolele, the kingdom of Judah, the kingdom of Yaounde. And they also, the black Arabs also had their part to play in it. So in this time we must question like these things that they gave us, Christianity, handing us a Bible, how deep does the deception go? How deep does the deception go? We as the Bantu people need to begin to really understand who we are and come to the knowledge of the truth and break away from all forms of religion. Religion, not, not knowing and fearing our creator. There's a difference between knowing and fearing our creator and being in a religion. But we must get back to the truth and we must understand that we ourselves have to repent and turn back to the Father in truth and the Spirit. We have to hate evil. We have to show that we fear him and hate evil, teach that which is good and stand up against evil and trust in him. Trust that he will be our shield. He is our shield. Having a spiritual relationship, knowing that you are always protected by him. And we must get back to our sense of community, which they have taken from us which is why I will continue to be pushing this philosophy that comes from the Bantu people called Ubuntu or said Ubuntu, 
meaning I am because we are. We are because I am. The solution begins with each one of us committing ourselves to live for our Heavenly Father and to live for one another. We must be corrupt, free from all forms of evil and hate evil and stand up against all forms of evil and corruption. Money can become worthless, but corruption free houses, communities, and nations will always be priceless. So Ubuntu, I am corruption free because we are corruption free. We are corruption free because I am corruption free. This is something we must know, we must cling to. And when it comes to religion, when it comes to Christianity and this Bible that they have given us, we must begin to question, is this the full truth or is this manipulated? I am going to be exposing the purpose and the reason they gave us this Bible. I'm going to be breaking that down. So if you are, um, well, first, let me say thank you for watching. If you are not subscribed, please like and share and subscribe. Subscribe to the channel so that you can see the uh, messages that will be coming forth as we break through and break free from the mental enslavement that we have been put in and as truth is being revealed because the upcoming videos that I will be doing are going to be quite shocking and when we talk about having a Christian or a messianic background things are coming to surface that are going to blow people's minds I'm just going to say it like that so with that being said be increased. May our Heavenly Father continue to guide you in all truth, wisdom, and understanding. May he make your path straight. And may he fill you with peace. And may he fill you with, fill you with the true fear of him, which is to hate evil. Until next time, be increased. And may the Father be with you.